Hi folks, it's Darren again uh, from Init6. And well, I'm a network engineer, right? And I'm learning to code and I'm learning about network automation, the same as, as all you folks. And I go on the internet and I see code that, that people have developed and some looks fantastic and others not so, but um, it's hard for me to know what's good code and what's bad code. So I asked around some friends and one in particular, uh, Jeremy is with, with us today. He's gonna give us some indications of, of an approach that he would take to building API clients. This is something he does um, very regularly and he's offered to give me some pointers and, and, and the approaches and how to, to go about it. So uh, thanks for your time, Jeremy, really appreciate it. And uh, well, what, what, uh, where do we go from here? Yeah. So, uh, you know, thanks, Darren. Happy to help out. And uh, yeah, I mean, like like most folks uh, who are learning to you know write code, they probably are looking at a lot of examples or, or see their you know colleagues and friends writing code. And uh, you know, I, I, I would stress that there are very few right or wrong ways to to do code in Python. There there's something called PEP eight, which is kind of the 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 style guide. So if you're not familiar with PEP eight, um, it's a pretty short document, but it kind of indicates you know how you uh, write variables whether you use what's called camel case or using underscores and lower case things like that sure um, we'll cover a little bits of that here and there but what I'm gonna really focus on is how uh, somebody could use Python to interact with a, a system like IP fabric that supports a rest API right. because we hear often you know, Products have APIs and network engineers are like, great, but what do I do with them? Or how do I interact with them? You know, you hear you hear all this, uh, all the all the folks writing stuff with Ansible or Nornir or all these different libraries, you know, Napalm and such. Um, but uh, I'm gonna really focus on uh, interacting with a REST API for from a product. You know, IP Fabric has a very well-defined RESTful API, yeah. and focus on how I would develop a client library to interact with that with that product. That sounds fantastic. It's it's something that that I've been dealing a lot with is is looking at how to interact between different systems. So pulling API data from one environment, pushing it into another, and I've been doing this really simply using clumsy a clumsy approach but it's the way I'm, I can see to get it working and what I'm looking for really is a better way a, a, a more structured way and hopefully we'll be able to take that away from today so thanks for this yeah yeah and a lot of it just comes with experience you know um, some folks who may have already started developing with Python may be familiar with a, a library called requests it's been kind of the workhorse Python library for a very very long time yeah. Um, I'm going to use a, a Python library called HTTPX, okay. which has an almost nearly identical programming interface. So if you've if you've used uh, requests, then what I'm going to show with HTTPX should look and feel very very similar. Right, so there's a few there's a few nuances, uh, some upgrades I would call it, uh, and differences with HTTP, HTTPX, which I'll cover. Um, but let's get right into it. Yeah. You know what you're. What we're looking at here is the IP Fabric um, dashboard. You know, this is the product I'm logged into. I can see the URL here. And the first thing that you know you need to figure out is how do you log in or authenticate? And some products require a username and password. Some of them uh, require uh, kind of an OAuth token sequence. Uh, in in the case of IP Fabric, they've made it uh, very simple with what's called a persistent token. This is this is very common. You'd find this. Uh, perhaps like if you use Netbox, yeah. you know, Netbox allows for the creation of persistent tokens. Yeah. So I'm going to use, I'm going to create a token here and IP Fabric even tells you how to use this token in a RESTful call. And, uh, and, and what we're seeing here with the curl example is a very common approach for vendors to show how to use, you know, an API without even writing any code. And uh, if you're familiar with the curl command, right? Um, what's important here is we can see that it uses a header, right? right? Yeah. Called X, you know, and and when you see an X dash, what that really means is it's a uh, a vendor specific or a non-standard non uh, header. Yeah. And uh, so I'm going to create a token. Cool. And uh, so this is the token here, and I'm going to say this is you know Jeremy's token, and I'm, it's never going to expire, and I'm going to allow for uh, read uh, read capabilities. So that's all I'm going to do with this. With this token, I'm just going to read data out of it. Now, note the warning, right? We want to cop cap capture this. 
So I'm going to copy that. And what I like to do is I'll create up a file called setup.env. This is just a text file, and I'm going to put uh, I'm going to create a variable called IPF token, and I'm just going to stick the token there. Now, you can see that it's just variable equals value. There's really no magic here. And I'm also going to copy the URL, and I'm going to call this uh, oops, IPF adder is equal to this. And uh, all I really want here is the, uh, the the URL to the product. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to create that. So that's right. just like a couple of environment variables, I guess, in the grand scheme of things. Um, that's right. So because... they're always accessible. That's right, because uh, there are many ways you can pass username, passwords, credentials of any kind into your client library. A very common practice is to use environment variables. So what I did is I just stored these as, as environment variables. Now what I do, I'm using Bash or Z shell, okay. and, and you can use this um, setting to say if I'm going to source a uh, file, so dot is a way to kind of um, read in, yeah. if you will, file. Now, if I look at uh, IP Fabric token, you know, I've got an environment right, variable. Right. So that can so be that's, passed, that... passed into whatever scripting or whatever you're, you're, you're using. That's right. So I, I've got a, a, a virtualized environment yeah. here, and uh, I also have uh, uh, interactive Python as, an, as kind of a, an interpreter, and I've got an alias. So if I type in PY, what it's really doing is it's starting uh, interactive Python. Okay. Um, so for debug and, and testing, I always use IPython. It, it, if you're not familiar with IPython, it's it's kind of the Python um, uh, uh, REPL, as they call it. You know, you can type things in and see see the response. It looks and feels like a CLI to okay. me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And and it also gives you the ability to like tab complete, which is really a key feature an uplift over the standard Python, you know, kind of interpreter. Sure, sure. So I'm going to do like import OS, and then I could say, uh, if I just hit tab there, and you can see yeah, yeah. it's tab completing, you know, the name of a function for me. And here I want to see IPF token, right? I can see that it's there. Right? right, perfect. And if I do IPF and I hit tab here, it's not going to read the environment, you know, for me, which is not unexpected, but I can see these two things here. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is I want to, uh, you know, get some data. Like I want to replicate this particular example. Okay. Just to make sure that my token is valid and I can hit this correctly. So the first thing I'm going to do is with, with HTTPX, I'm going to use what's called a client instance. So I can say from HTTPX, import client. And so what I want to do is I want to create a client uh, instance so that I can store the token variable as part of the header and it will get reused again and again and again so I don't have to keep providing it. Sure. Uh, so if you're familiar with requests, that's kind of like what they call a session. Uh, it's the same construct. Okay, so I'll, I'll create a variable called client and one thing you can do is you can provide it a base URL. And what that means is if I provided the base URL, I don't have to continuously add this part of the URL every time I want to make an H, uh, a REST call. So for example, I would, uh, you know, I would take this value here mm -hmm. and then I would add slash API to it and maybe even V1 to it. Yeah. Right, so that's going to give me this part of the URL. So all you need okay. then is the is the detail of the endpoint that changes for each well for each endpoint you're trying to hit the the detail of the URL each time. That's correct. Yeah, and and because I don't want to do SSL, you know, validation, I'm just going to say verify is false. So now what I have is a variable that's going to have the same types of functions. That folks would be, you know, familiar with with, with the request. You know, there's a get mm -hmm. and there's a post, and those are basically the two main functions people will use in a RESTful API. You know, there's others like delete, for example, if you want to delete something. Mm 
But here, if we follow this example, we want to do a get on snapshots, yeah. and we want to store the token in this header. Okay. So what we can see is that the IP uh, IPF variable has a structure called headers, uh, okay. which which behaves like a dictionary. Uh -huh. Right. And so now I can say uh, IPF dot headers headers, and then I will copy. You know, this is the header that we want to create. And, we, and the value that we want is our token. Right. So this is going to be token. Gotcha. We can see that it's stored here. Gotcha. Okay. You also notice that you know you don't have to worry about casing. You know, upcase or lowercase. It stores as lowercase, but if you fetched it as uppercase, it would, you know, return back the correct value. Right. Great stuff. Okay. If you're if you're using special purpose headers like uh, authorization is, is an example. It will actually uh, not show you the value. So if you have like a username password set up in here, it would actually just show you kind of the word quote secure. Oh, okay. So you wouldn't accidentally see it. All right, so, so far so good. So now we're gonna do a get, right? And here we know we just need to do snapshots. Okay. And if I just hit enter, you know, I know that I'm getting a response and I know that the response is okay. So I'm gonna store that to a variable, okay? And if I look at what that variable gives me, right? Doing a DIR on a variable will tell you, well, what you know properties or functions does it provide? And so we can see that there is one called is error, right? So I can say is error, and that will tell me whether or not there was an error in that function when we made that call. Sure. So in if you were using requests, they had something called OK, which is kind of the inverse of is error. <laughs> yes. right. Yeah, I've used that requests OK, yeah, uh, on on a lots of if statements uh, before. So yeah, yeah, for me. Yeah. The, the other the other thing you can do is when you write code programmatically, you could do something called raise for status, and what that means is um, if you wanted to write code that said I'm going to execute my my request. And then if there was any error whatsoever, I'm going to raise an exception, meaning I can just do that. And I, I'm, it didn't raise an exception because there was no error, sure. right? Um, rather than writing a whole bunch of if code, like if this, if that, did, was it an error, was it not an error? You know, raise for status will do the, the code check to say, well, was it an error? And if it was, then automatically raise a specific exception that, that was relative to that error. Yeah, so so um, thinking about, again, uh, code that I've written, you'd have a, a try um, accept um, stanza to, to deal with that, would you? Yeah, and then generally the way I write, you know, my kind of, my, my program is, is I would put these raise for status throughout the, the body of the client and then somewhere in the main program, if you will, that, that uses that client, Almost in the most top level area of that code, yeah. I would I would do a try accept block and I would catch specific HTTP uh, you know exceptions you know at that level. Right. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, uh, all right. So what's interesting here is we have this result, but what do we do with it? Um, well, you can see that there's some text, right? And that's going to be the actual text. Now we can see what this text looks like, uh, JSON. But it's actually text here, yeah. right? And what we want is the JSON so we can interact with the body. And we can see that there is something called uh, JSON, which you know gives you <laughs> You'd hope. it, which gives you the stuff, right? And I could I could look at this and go, well, what is it? Oh, I can see that it's a list. I can see that what this API gave me back was a list. And if I wanted to look at you know one element of that list, I can see this is what the first element looks like in that list, right? Which if I were to go to the snapshots, you know, it's gonna give me a list of these snapshots, yeah. right? So I can see exactly, you know, what snapshots are here and, and what is in, you know, each of these snapshots, right? So this is, this is doing two things. You know, I validated that the token that I programmed into my client was good. Well. What what does an error look like? If I said IPF headers, and then uh, I wanted to change this, mm -hmm. for example, something you know, not good. 
And I and I tried to run that command again. Yeah. So if I says res equals, and what I just did there is uh, uh, in interactive Python has a history reverse look back. Okay. So if you hit like if you hit Control R, I can search backwards through my commands, and that way I can just go find something that looked like what I just typed. And so I ran that command, and now I can see that the error is 401 because my token isn't good. Yeah. And if I looked at the text, it says unauthorized. And if I did res is error, which sure. is that it, there was an error. Right. And if I do uh, raise for status, I can see that this would be the exception that would have gotten raised. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Oh, so just, well, I, I, and, yeah. and again, so. Now you you know you've got that try and accept stanza. You're able to do an accept based on HTTP status error, and then deal with it in some shape or form, knowing what. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. All right. So let's put the headers back. And that OS environment IPF took. Great. And cool. Again, if I hit Control R and then I type backwards like res equals, it finds what I want, you know, and I can validate that. Okay, everything's back to normal. Perfect. All right. So, any questions so far? Like we've gone through just kind of the, the basic mechanics of setting up a client and, and interacting with the system. No, that's great. That's great. I, one one thing I have already noted is I I need to get into IPython because this looks like it's really really useful to get that sort of dynamic approach to putting these things together so uh, i'm so used to again editing a file r running it editing the file running it you know getting or going through that that sort of uh, dynamic uh, process in vs uh, virtual studio code or something like that but i like that having the hands-on of the like you said it's almost like a cli being able to just get on and, and do so uh, yeah that's uh, yeah that's one one uh, note i've already made so Fantastic. Cool. Yeah, there's a couple of, of kind of systems like IPython. There's another one called BiPython, which is even, you know, you, you know, some people like that even more because it gives you even more, you know, kind of tab completion and built-in sure. help. Um, and then if you're using an editor like uh, VS Code or I, I use PyCharm, you it it is likely to have a setting where you can change what the terminal uh, console looks like. For example, in PyCharm, I could say, well, I want to open up a Python console here. And it knows, for example, whether or not I've got um, uh, I, the uh, IPython installed or not, and it will drop into that console okay. here. Okay. So, cool. yeah, and I, I expect, you know, VS Code has I, something very similar. I, I expect yeah. so, but uh, yeah, I've not, not looked uh, that far yet, so. Well, those types of kind of productivity enhancers are really going to change your look and feel for development. Sure. Meaning, you know, as you're writing code, you know, a lot of people may feel um, like there's a lot of friction if I'm doing the process you described. You're like, I, I have a file, I edit it, I run it, you know, I'm trying to figure something out. And I go through that kind of, you know, edit, run, debug cycle yeah. versus just kind of experimentally typing into um Something like here. Yeah, no, agreed. It, it feels much more natural. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Like okay. That. So let's do something a little bit more more interesting now. Like, let's say we're going to look at uh, inventory and we look at devices. And what we can see is like these are all the devices. And if I wanted to uh, run the same API call, I can you know click this table description button and it's going to tell me exactly what what I want to execute in this API, right? So I can see that it's a tables inventory devices. And then we see this request payload. Well, what does that mean? You know, that's the body of the payload that we want to, you know, put into the request. Yeah. And how do you do that? Um, well, the way that that works is if I wanted to do a post command, right? And if I said, you know, help IPF post, you know, this isn't very helpful reading through this yeah. um, because this is just, you know, their built-in documentation. Yeah. I can see that the first parameter is a URL and there's a whole bunch of other stuff in here, right? One of the things that I know from reading the docs is I can post a payload, right? So let's say I wanted to post uh, this payload, right? Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to get all of the columns, right? I didn't want to get all of this stuff. So the first thing I know is 
my URL is going to be this part, right? So I can say URL is equal to to that. Like that's that's the post that we're going to write a post to. And these these uh, this kind of dictionary, right? This payload, yeah. right? I can make I can make something called payload, mm -hmm. and I can say payload is a dictionary. And uh, let's say that I want the columns uh, to be all of these columns just like this. All right, so I'm going to say col columns is equal to this. All right now, if I close this off and I look at payloads, did I spell it wrong? Payload. Payload. You can see like there is a key called column, yeah, yeah. and then these are the fields of that key. And uh, and then let's use the same snapshot ID. So I'm going to uh, create a variable called snapshot ID and. Because we're going to use, oops, we're going to use it again and again. Yep. Snapshot ID is equal to this. And I'm just going to copy this. Great. And uh, let's just start with that. Like, let's see what happens. If I said, um, uh, let's say I wanted, I have my payload. And my payload has to include something called snapshot. Snapshot. I'm going to set that to snapshot ID, mm -hmm. right? So I've got payload. Yeah. All right. So now I'm going to say IPF post, and the URL is going to be equal to the URL that I set. And then I can pass a JSON body request like this. Okay. So that comes back and says, hey, that was okay. And then I'm just going to say, okay, well, what was it? Okay, it's a dictionary. This is how I kind of figure out what APIs give sure, me back. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so if I didn't have a well-defined, you know, document of how the API behaves, this is how I kind of, you know, figure, figure it, out. it out. Yeah, yeah. So I can see that this body has data and meta. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, what what is meta? Meta basically tells me information about this. It says, okay, there are 481 records. And this tells me that I got all 481 records back. Like I didn't paginate yeah, yeah. the data. Okay. And then if I said, well, what is um, body data? It says, okay, it's a list. And uh, what is what's in the list? It's a dictionary. And if I wanted to look at one of them, you know, I could pretty print it out. Oops, I, can, I have to uh, from pretty print import pretty print. So PP is something you might be familiar with from uh, the IPython debugger. Okay. But if you wanted to use it interactively, you could do the same here. So body data zero. And this tells me like here is information about one of the, the records, yeah. you know, in the inventory. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So far, so good. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's good. All right. Well, you know, one of the things that we might want to do is maybe we want to filter out the data. Maybe we don't want all the records. Maybe we only want certain kinds of records, right? So let's say I make an advanced filter and I say, well, uh, I only want uh, vendor uh, vendor is equal to Cisco, right? And I can try it out. Mm -hmm. I can say, what does that look like? Okay. And get all these things, yeah. right? And uh, you know. Well, maybe I don't want uh, iOS, right? So let's add another rule and say uh, uh, family family is uh, not equal to not equal to iOS. Mm -hmm. Let's see what else is in here. Okay, so and uh, I don't know what FTD is, <laughs> so uh, let's filter that out to do. Uh, I don't know what that is. It's, uh, yeah, that'll be a firepower threat given it's uh, to appliance. Just... Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I don't want that either. Okay. So now I have 14 records. Cool. And uh, if, I, if I hit question mark again, you know, what I notice is I have this thing called filters, which is the, the structure of the IP fabric uh, filtering okay. yeah, yeah. language. Right, so that's pretty handy. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of capture that, and I'm gonna say uh, filters is equal to is equal to that. So now I have filters. 
Now, I could have typed that all out by hand, yeah. you know, and created that dictionary, but I'm lazy. I'm just going to copy and paste it here. That's what it's there for. Right? And so now I have, what's that? That's what it's there for. It's there to, yeah. 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 So now I'm, I have my payload. This is my request payload. Yeah. And now I'm going to add filters is equal to uh, filters. And I'm going to run that request again. So I'm going to request equals the same thing. And now if I look at the result, I can see that I only have 14 records. Nice. And if I, if I wanted to look at like, well, what are the, what are the host names for that? I could just say, um, well, I know body data is on my records. Mm -hmm. And I could say, you know, for record in, in that, what I really want is, for example, the host name. Uh, and that's going to tell me all my, these are all my hosts, for example. See if that's, yeah. and again, what you just did there, that, I mean, that's just, just expanding that out as you go, just so that you can then take that information and put it in the script when it comes to it, actually writing the script. And because you've got IPython, you're able to interactively build that view up. That's the thing. That's the thing that's missing for me, for sure. But uh, I can, it helps with the logic of what you're trying to achieve. So. Yeah, looking good. Yeah, yeah, and so the other the other thing like for the get the the IPF you know the get function actually has something similar to uh, the the JSON function. It has something called params, and you can give params a dictionary. So these become the parameters to you know the URL here. Uh, okay, you know? okay. So if you if you had to do a get function. And you wanted to pass get some some parameters to you know control the behavior of that get. This is where you would use the thing called params exactly in the same way that you use you know payload. You create a dictionary of keys and values, and then when the get is executed, the HTTPX library will convert that into the you know the question mark equals ampersand comma blah 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 blah. And you don't have to like try to formulate that string manually um you can just give it a dictionary of parameters yeah, yeah. does that make sense yeah 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 i, I know exactly what you're talking about those, okay uh, yeah i'm just i'm just trying to find an example of one of those that you might be able to use yeah i mean you know in in most um in, in most restful apis you always find a get you know and, and the get will always you know have some sort of parameters um you know it's, it's just it's just the nature of the api yeah, cool. Uh, all right. So, you know, what we've really learned here, I think, is a couple of things. Um, HTTPX allows you to, you know, perform restful, restful functions by calling the name of that function, you know, like get yeah. or paran uh, or um, post or put. And there's a delete. There's a delete in here as well. Um, I like using HTTPX because it has this base URL capability, so I don't have to remember, you know, the, the full that path. Is, that's very cool. Yeah. But what we also learned is that there's going to be some values that you want to maintain over the course of using your client. For example, snapshot ID is something that you're going to use again and again and again and again, right? You don't want to necessarily always have to, um, you know, keep a, what I would call a loose variable, yeah. right? Yeah. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of create an, a subclass of client, and I'm going to use that, meaning, you know, here is my uh, Python uh, code or an editor. And I'm going to say from HTTPX uh, import a client. And now I'm going to create a subclass of client. I'm going to say class IP fabric client, you know, inherits from client. Okay. Right. Now, what I want to do is I want to extend the capability so that I can save, you know, the snapshot ID value. And I also want it to automatically uh, set up my um, my base URL okay. and my token based on my environment. OK, right. so the first thing I'm going to do is um, the client uh, can take some parameters, right? When you create an instance of of a client, right? Okay. Remember when I created a client, I said IPF is equal to IPF is equal to this. Yeah. You know, base URL was a parameter, yeah. right? Verify was a parameter, mm -hmm. and so 
if you ever see something that looks like this, what what this is really doing is it's saying, I don't care what the user provided me. Like this is going to capture uh, variables without parameter names. Okay. Right. For example. Okay. Okay. So if I had not used the word yeah, base yeah, URL yeah. here, that would have been a positional parameter. I was just going to say. So this is that's where you've got yeah where, where the order of the, the parameters is important based on and it maps to the parameters in the like in a function or whatever, right? Right. Right. So what I know is like if I wanted to invoke client you know, much the same way I did in my interactive Python, what I do is I um, I call what's called a super class of init. So I'm going to do super init, and I'm going to pass it the variable arguments and the keyword argument. So this is, in effect, just like, um, you know, just basically making the same call. Right, okay. Right? So, it's, so when you're saying super, that's the, the class that I've inherited from, basically. That's right. And if we wanted to just test this out, you know, I would just go into, you know, IPython and I'd drop this in here and I'd say IPF is equal to IP fabric client now, you know, like this. Yeah. Now I didn't give it the base URL or anything, so it's not going to work. But if I did base URL is equal to, well, let me do this. Uh, IP fabric client is base URL is equal to OS environment mm -hmm. IP F adder and uh, verify is false. I can see that the base URL was set, you know, because I'm essentially kind of flowing through uh, the variables that I that I called. It just gets passed up. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay, well, let's say I don't want to do that. Like, like let's say uh, what I really want to do is I want to do that by default all the time. So I could say, you know, base URL is equal to OS environment IPF adder, uh -huh. right? And I could say uh, token is equal to OS environment IPF token, right? And then what I could do is I could say before any other keyword args, I could say base URL is equal right. to base URL. And then I could also say, you know, verify equals false and it's going to by default you know set that up so those would override anything that's come in from um, uh, from from the command line then, or from from the call, ah. from the call into the init well no okay. and actually I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to show you how to account for that okay. what this is going to do is this is going to just add these into the the parameters okay. so the question is, well, what happens if I already provided them, right? And I'm going to show, and, and what will happen is a bug. Okay. Yeah, and I'm going to show you how you account for that because cool, that's cool. that's actually an excellent uh, question. Now, I haven't used token yet, but once I do have set this up, I could say self headers, and then the uh, the special header variable, which I can't remember what it was. So it was like X API oh, token XAPI or something. Token. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this. I could say this is equal to uh, token. And then more or less, this is this is good. So I'm going to uh, exit out, open up Py PyCharm or uh, Interactive Python. IPF is equal to IP Fabric Client. No parameters, and I can see that you know my API token is correct, and I could say you know get my snapshots. You know everything's copacetic, right? But the question is, is, what if I actually gave it a base URL, right? Let's say I did base URL is equal to foo, right? And now it says, uh-oh, no, you've got duplicate values. values. Okay. <laughs> right? right? So here's, here's a very good thing to know about dictionaries and uh, Python. And this is something that I saw very early on in my my Pythonic you know learning days, and I'm like, when would I ever use that thing? So I'm going to show you what it is, and then I'm going to show you how you use it. Okay. Let's say I made a dictionary called um, you know user user is a dictionary, right? So I could say user name is 
uh, Jeremy, right? And I could say user state is uh, North Carolina, mm -hmm. right? So there's a dictionary. Yeah. Right? We all we all know dictionaries. Yeah. Now, dictionary has this function called set default. Okay. And this is actually a very powerful thing to use. And here's what it does. It says, if the key does not exist, set it to what you give me. So if I said user set default state to New York, it's going to return the key of state. And if that key does not exist, if state did not exist, it's going to, by default, set it to New York. Now, based on what we have right now, it's going to come back and give me North Carolina, okay. right? But if I created a different key, like zip code, it's going to give me back 111111 because it didn't exist, right? Okay. Yeah. So what this means is, is you can use set default to set a value, but only if it wasn't already set. Uh, I'm with you. No. So here's how you use that. You would say keyword args set default base URL, right? Yeah. And so now uh, I don't need base URL because it's going to get set. If it wasn't if it provided wasn't to me. Provided in the, uh, okay. yep. Yeah, 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 got it. Okay, so now if I go back and do this exercise, and I say IP fabric is equal to IP fabric, right? The base URL is gonna buy, it's gonna pick it up by the uh, yeah. the environment, but if I provided it. URL, it's going to, it's going to, okay. So the next question is, well, what if the environment wasn't set, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Because right here I'm saying, oh, well, I'm going to pull it from the environment, but what yeah, if it yeah, isn't yeah. set here, right? So if I uh, unset uh, IPF ADDR and I do the same thing, Here's what's happened. It says, oh, I have a key error because, you know, because that variable doesn't, doesn't exist. exist. Yeah. Right. Now, depending on how you want to write your code, you can do a couple of different things here. Right. You know, uh, you could, when you're writing the code that uses this client, you could trap for key error. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't find key error to be very helpful, you know, as a programmer. Right. If somebody says, here's a key error, I'm like, well, why? Why is that? Yeah, you know. You could put something like this in here. You could say, you can do a try catch inside here. It says, well, if I get a key error, then, you know, raise a runtime error that basically says, um, you know, base URL not provided or IPF adder not in environment or something like that, yeah. right? Um, and so, that would um, at least catch the run the key error, right? But it doesn't catch the the thing like what what if somebody didn't provide a, a base URL at all, right? Well, let's say you wanted to make sure that somebody provided a a base URL, right? Because I I could do this I could say um, I could say IPF is equal to IP fabric client, right? Mm -hmm. And um, if I don't provide this, it's going to trap it and says, hey, base URL not provider IP fabric adder not in environment. Yeah. Right. Um, let's think. Okay, so let's say that the IP fabric. Uh, let me reload my variable. And so now IP fabric, it does exist. Right. And uh, but you can also put in like other checks here, like you can get very defensive programming. Right. <laughs> so so let's say that um, IP fabric address was empty, like for the sake of argument. Right. Let's say export IPF adder is empty. Mm 
not valid. But it exists, right? But it exists, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And so if we did this, it's fine, right? Yeah. But my base URL is now, it's, it's not, it's, it's yeah, broken. Yeah. So what we could also do is we could uh, assert that um, I have a value. So you can use assert in a different ways, but basically what assert does is it says, make sure whatever this expression evaluates to is true. And if it isn't true, then raise what's called an assertion error. So here I could say assertion error or key error, right? Okay. So, so what's gonna happen is, is IPF adder is gonna be a null value, right? Yeah. And, um, and now it's gonna trap for that. Right. Now I didn't I didn't explicitly say that it's I, I should have a better error message here. It's like it, or it could be empty, right? But what you're seeing me do here is what's called defensive programming. Yeah. It's it's basically saying I'm presuming that I'm gonna get some set of inputs and I wanna validate those inputs pretty pretty you know, you know, I wanna constrain my input so that I don't make a mistake. Yeah. Like I could pass a value called foo here, and then I would try to use foo later, and then it wouldn't be a valid. It's not a valid URL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? this this feels right. So this feels almost the the opposite way around to what what someone who's coming into this from the other side of things might do. In i.e., they they code things line by line because that's they, they want to do something, and then when they get it working, they go back and then and then try and plug the gaps or plug the holes. That they've left open by getting something working so it's uh, that defensive programming thing i suppose this is all about making sure that everything is is as it as it needs to be before you get into the the nitty-gritty of, of worrying about what's working and what isn't yeah i think this this makes a lot of sense yeah i mean what happens is is the the more you get into defensive programming as you run experiments or you explore APIs or whatnot, you, you won't make the, the copy and paste error mm -hmm. as much. You know, just like there's copy and paste errors in CLIs, you know, using a CLI, you're gonna make copy and paste errors when you're when you're programming. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's gonna happen. So the, the difference between the CLI and programming is that you can write code defensively, yeah. right? And that's, this is an example. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on one more topic. Okay. Um, and you know, because you know, I could talk for for hours. But <laughs> uh, don't worry, but, we'll get you. We'll get you back to talk more. Don't worry about that. The, but the other thing about doing an extension is, is that yeah. you can declare variables and functions that are going to be relevant. For example, I could say uh, snapshot ID. Like I want to. I want my. I want my new client to actually remember my snapshot ID, okay. so that I can use it again and again and again. Right. So maybe uh, it, maybe I pass it in at the time that I initialize mm -hmm. it, or maybe I'm going to set the value later, right? So I could do something like this. I could say snapshot ID by default is none, and what that means is if I don't if I don't give it when I you know call in it, yeah. it's just going to set it to none by right. default. Right. So the next thing is is let's say that I want to extend this this client so that it actually has a function called fetch table, okay. right? Because in this particular API, most of the really interesting things I can pull out of it is what is called, you know, by a table, yeah. much like you saw with with the device with the devices table. Sure. So I'm going to make a function, or really a method, because methods are functions for for classes. Okay. So I'm going to call this fetch table. Okay. All right. And we know we need a URL, mm -hmm. absolutely. And then there's other things that we could pass. Right. We know that these APIs take columns, yeah. filters, pagination, the snapshot and something called reports, which I'm going to ignore reports for the moment. Yeah. OK. OK. So I could say, um, you know, columns. We know that the columns is one. Filters is another. Pagination is another. Columns, filters, pagination and snapshot and snapshot. ID, oops, snapshot ID, okay. Okay. All right, now uh, I, I like to use what are called um, Python type annotations, right? Okay. So 
Again, this is a form of kind of defensive programming of sorts. It, it basically lets me know that I'm not trying to do something that I wasn't supposed to do when I'm writing the code. So from typing, um, I'm going to uh, import a list and a dictionary. So for example, I know that columns should be uh, a list of strings. Right. right. Filters should be uh, a dictionary. Pagination should be uh, a dictionary. Right. And uh, snapshot ID should be a string. Gosh. Now that reminds me of, uh, reminds me of my my Pascal and, and modular two programming way back in the uh, way back in the eighties. That stuff. Yeah. You know, and type annotations are something somewhat new, you know, to Python 3. I don't know, 3.7, 3.8. Uh -huh. You know, I started using them in 3.8, which is what I'm using here. Yeah. Now, the other thing is, is that um, some of these things are optional and some of them are not. Columns is not optional, but filters is, right? So we can say that this is an, an optional, Excellent. an optional dictionary. Oops, I got to learn how to type correctly. And pagination is an optional dictionary. And snapshot ID could be an optional string. And if it isn't provided, you know, what we want to use is our current value. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's kind of put this together. We know that we're going to have something called a payload when we make a request. Yeah. Right. And that payload is going to have you know, a dictionary. So we know that there's columns, right? Yeah. And uh, and we know that uh, there has to be a snapshot ID, which could be either the snapshot ID that we provided yeah. in the call, or we can use the default one. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of our minimum viable payload. Okay. Now we could do something like, you know, we could check to make sure that it was not null because because we should, right? We could say, you know, assert, you know, payload snapshot ID. Just make sure that it's not null. Yeah. Like we we could be defensive programming here. I'm not going to do that. Sure. Just interesting. But what if there's a filters? So we could say, well, um, you know, if filters was provided, then maybe we want, you know, payloads filters to be added, right? Filters. Yeah. And the same thing with uh, pagination. We could say, you know, if pagination was was provided, then, you know, add pagination, right? Yeah. And there's different ways to code this type of logic, but I'm just doing this, you know, kind of in a straightforward way, yeah, so we can yeah. kind of see so, it. So, I, so but, I, I, I get it. I, it's clear. So that's the important yeah. stage. Yeah. And, and so now we want to do a post to the URL, and the uh, and we want to pass it the JSON payload, which is going to give us a result. And maybe we always want to do raise for error or raise for status. Mm -hmm. And then we always want to get the body back because at this point we know that the data is good. And maybe we only want to return the body data. We don't really care about the metadata. Sure, sure. Okay. So this is kind of a, a function now that lets us get any any table that we want, and it does this pattern for us. Yeah. Okay. So awesome. I'm going to kind of do this code. And so now I can say I, I have a client, and of course I forgot. To put it back, see, that happens. Oh, the other thing you can do with I, uh, IPython, you can see I'm like I'm copying and pasting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gonna, you don't have to I do that. You can do, um, you can just say dash i for interactive, right. and then it's going to load that data file, which is really the way you should well, do this. Once perfect. once things get kind of big, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can just say. I want to run this program, but I want to drop into interactive. And because this file isn't really doing anything, yeah. it's just just creating the, the classes and the method. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So um, I could do this now. I could say IP Fabric Client. And now if I look at IP Fabric Client, I can see that there's this new thing in here called Fetch Table. Yeah. yeah. So now I could say Fetch Table, and the URL is going to be equal to. Uh, 
you know, if I really wanted to be fancy, maybe I could have even prefixed the tables part. So I didn't have to <laughs> the tables part. And then if I tried to do this, it would say, Hey, you know, you forgot columns and oh, it says, even though you told me filters were optional, and pagination was optional, all these things were optional, you forgot to define the default value. Ah, okay. So really what you need to do here is you would say is uh, equal to none yep. by default. Same thing here is uh, equal to none by default. And the same thing here is equal to none by default, right? So we just do the same thing. And it Oops. then just says. Oops. And I'll just do uh, fetch table. OK, it says, oh, you forgot to give me columns because columns Perfect. is, in fact, required. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I said columns, columns is equal to, uh, say, host name. Say all I really cared about was host name and site name. Yeah. And maybe vendor and maybe family. Oh, and maybe version. <laughs> OK. OK. And now it said, oh, hey, you messed up. Uh, you know, what did you do wrong? Right? Let's say I did that. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> so that, uh, that never happened. <laughs> so now I can do try, you know, and then I'll put an accept block in here, accept exception as exc. And then I just set a breakpoint. This is what I do breakpoint, and then x equals one. I'll explain the x equals one okay. in a minute. So now I'm inside this exception block. Right. And I can see like, hey, something's not a, something's wrong. And so I think it's response text. Uh, uh, it says that's not allowed. I can't do that. Is it the? Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at the the URL there. You're missing an API v1. Am I though? Because I, you know, base URL. Nope, I am. Thank you. It's okay. You know what? So this needs to do blah, 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 blah. So then here, what we want to do is we want to say kwargs base URL. We want to add API v1 to it by default. Yep. Yeah. All right. So now we can do IP fabric. And we could say uh, fetch table. Oh, still got an exception. Okay. Can't process that. Let's see what that error is. It says, oh, snapshot is required and you forgot to give it to me. Right, snapshot, so, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we forgot. So we said snapshot ID here. That was a code bug. Boink. Right? Now, I know that we haven't given the snapshot ID, by the way. So this yeah, yeah. is going to result in, in another type of error. So we can just do this again. This will be the last exercise we do for this. <laughs> OK, so we're going to say IPF equals IP fabric. And then let's try to fetch the table. Okay, again, we're in the yeah. exception. Yeah. This makes sense. Yeah. So we said, what's the exception response text? It's basically saying, hey, you didn't give me a value for snapshot, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that that's missing. So there's a couple of different ways to address this. I'm What I'm going to do for right now is I'm just going to take this value here. And I'm going to say uh, IPF snapshot ID is equal to this value. And then I'm going to hit up arrow until I get back to this code block okay. and then run it again. And now yeah, I actually get a result. Oh, God. Okay. God. okay. So why is it that I did that X equals one thing? The reason why is, is if you set a breakpoint, yeah. you know, what the what the editor is gonna do or the interpreter is gonna do is it's gonna position kind of the I'm gonna execute the next piece of code marker. On something. on something, and I always I always leave there something to be there, like x equals one or some marker there, so I know, you know, where I am, and so it doesn't kind of bleed into the next piece what of text. Behind it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if I don't do that, let's say that I take snapshot ID is equal to to that, and uh, and then I try to run that code again. 
and I didn't have that that x equals one there. What happens is, you know, I hit this break point in here. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not so it's not so bad. I think IPython actually traps this pretty well. Yeah. If I were running this in actual code, sometimes it like it points it, that little pointer here that you see here on one four. Sometimes it points it into like a function that's like <laughs> the next function to be called in the call stack, and it and it it, it kind of breaks my brain. It could be anywhere, right? It could be anywhere. Yeah. 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 So. So it's purely purely a placeholder, just so that you can see exactly what it is that you you're dealing with. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so I know we covered quite a, quite a lot yeah, here, yeah, yeah. Uh, but hopefully this kind of gives you an idea of you know using client, um, extending the initialization to you know set up your defaults, you know your base URL, yeah. you know any kind of you know header or variables that you want. Um, you can extend the client so that you can you know add your own value add you know calls rather than just get and post. You know you can really add anything you want as long as you don't. Right over the uh, the the known library, you know, functions that are part of yeah. HTTP client. Yeah, like, yeah. don't 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 overload. Like, get. Well, I mean, you could. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a dangerous thing to do. Yeah, there's another approach. There's one other approach. Rather than just overriding client, there's another pattern where you create a client, like a like a, a base client, and then you have as a as a variable of that base client, like I'm doing like snapshot ID, I would have something called .api, and .api would be this client. So the reason why some approaches take that is so that you don't kind of over accidentally overwrite right. the client's built-in functions or methods. Um, again, it's kind of a defensive programming measure. Yeah. Um, I've done both. You know, I've built client libraries where I'm, I'm natively extending client, and I've built some client libraries where I kind of wrap, you know, I would wrap the client as a, you know, as a uh, as an instance variable called API or something like that. You know, again, there's no right or wrong ways to do these things. But there's a lot of preference. But but yeah, I mean, uh, much more advanced than than the, the approach I'd have taken before, and and I can see why, and I think that's part of the. Part of the challenge as a, as a as a network engineer coming into this, I mean, you know, it's it's great that we're able to be taught to, to to do some of this stuff, but by doing it in a more structured way, it just makes life so much easier going forward. And I think the the, the code becomes more readable, more manageable, and I guess uh, more extensible going forward as well. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other takeaway that that I, I'd, I'd want to impress on people is, you know, even if you're starting with Python, you know, you're just getting started with it, and you're using libraries like, you know, PyATS is an excellent example of a very well built and supported, you know, library from the folks over at Cisco that you can use, right? You know, just natively, it's like I'm going to use it. I don't have to write my own client library, whatever. Uh, you know, you may find yourself wanting to, you know, write extensions to an existing library, or you may find yourself using a product that doesn't have a client library or has a client library and you don't like it. Or, you know, it doesn't suit your needs, for yeah, example. Yeah. Um, one of the other reasons why I use HTTPX is because it natively supports what's called asynchronous I.O. programming, whereas requests did not. And uh, and so what I've been finding is there's a lot of client libraries out there that um, are not AI, they're not uh, async IO native. Right. You know, over time, we'll see more of them. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, so I find myself writing a whole bunch of these client libraries because I do a lot of async IO programming. Yeah. Um, and I know that's a very advanced topic, you know, for, for pretty much anybody who's not ever done that. But the point is, is as people learn skills on how to write these types of extensions to existing libraries, um, they'll be able to customize the programming experience for what yeah. they want yeah. rather than waiting for somebody to fix something for them because the, the, the benefit and the attraction of open source and all of this code being available to people is so that you are no longer dependent on somebody else to get something done. Right, you know. Yeah, it's it's a bit of an it, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you can you can go ahead and you can pull pull all these um, these libraries and and whatever, uh, use them, and sometimes they just don't work. And so, what do you do? Do you sit back and wait and go, oh, I need to get someone to fix that, 
or do you like you say do you just pile in and go fix it yourself and do it the way that you want to do it but you've still got the other code there as a reference and you can still use that as a as a, ma a means by which you're getting to that end yeah yeah absolutely i mean the last thing that i would want you know is for somebody to tell me hey you know write all this code or be a programmer or you know learn this new thing and then when i get stuck i can't I can't help myself, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, well, now I have to open a, essentially you're back to the old, you know, <laughs> network operating system, well, file a, a feature request or write a bug report and then wait. I mean, if, if we all, if that's where we all are in the programming world, then, then that's a big fail. I was going to say, know? we've come all, we've come all the way around back to, to the way things, yeah. the way things have always been. Right. And that's, yeah. that's the whole point is to get away from that. So. Exactly. I mean, that to me is the big takeaway here. It's like you want to learn these skills so that you're no longer detrimentally reliant on some third party to fix a problem that you have. Yeah. If you are capable, you have the skills, you know, and, and the, the determination to like, you know, do it yourself. You don't have to wait, no. you know, go, go, and, and go for me, it. that's that's the biggest factor yeah. for me. Yeah. No, that's that's a, a great point on which uh, on which to close actually. So, uh, Jeremy, listen, I've learned loads in in an hour. You know, um, we're definitely going to have to do this again because uh, I'll uh, I hopefully won't forget it all because I'll have the, the recording. I can go back, but uh, once we get to to a certain point, I'll be uh, knocking on your door again to say, well, what's next? What do we do next? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, appreciate having... appreciate your time. Thank you very much. If people want to prod you for any more info or whatever where can they get hold of you uh they can find me on twitter as network automaniac uh, nwk automaniac um, i also have a youtube channel where uh, i host videos like this um so i'll probably put a link to the one that you create oh, um those are the two the two best places to find me uh on the internet great stuff all right well thank you for your time mate and uh i'll give you a shout after and uh, with that with that code problem that i wanted but uh, i didn't want to record it <laughs> Take care, man. Awesome. See Thank you. you. Cheers. Cheers.